John chapter 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. He was with God, and He was God. He was in the beginning with God. He created everything there is. Nothing exists that He didn't make. Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send a messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew chapter 1. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 2. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Some stories are so epic, they need more than one author to tell them. To this end, God chose four witnesses to explain the good news about Jesus. Each witness speaks with a tone all his own, but all speak with united power of the glorious arrival of the Christ. This Advent, we will listen to these four witnesses remind us of the miracle and triumph of our Savior's birth. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Confessors of Christ Church. My name is Tony Alonzo. I am the pastor here, and we're very excited for you guys to join us this morning as we begin our Advent series. Now, as Jerry mentioned, Advent means arrival, and so we are anxiously anticipating the arrival of the Son, Jesus. And that is what we are here celebrating. Now, the people of the Old Testament, there was actually 400 years between the last writing of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. And so they were waiting 400 years for this Messiah, this chosen one to come. And so we only have 24 more days to wait. And I don't know if that's an exciting thing for you or if that's a stressful thing for you, uh, but we are going to be spending these next four Sundays looking at the birth story of Jesus. We're going to be looking at the preparations. We're going to be looking at how he came into and entered into humanity. And we're going to see the purpose for which he came to accomplish. And so those are what we're going to be doing for this Advent season. And we're doing it through the lens of the four witnesses. The four witnesses are the very first four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so what we're going to be doing is each week we're going to be looking at the birth story or at the preparations, at the arrival of Jesus through these four Gospels. Today is going to be Matthew, next week will be Mark, then Luke, and then we will end right before Christmas with John. And so if you're trying to understand why we have four different accounts in the Bible, why are there four Gospels? Uh, an illustration that may be helpful is imagine that I sat four of my uh, children down after Thanksgiving, and I give them all the tasks that I want them to write a letter about their experiences that they've experienced on Thanksgiving. Well, Christian, Eleni, Caden, and Chloe, they would sit down and they would write from four different angles, and they've all experienced Thanksgiving differently. They all experienced certain aspects of it, and they remembered certain things, and they may want to highlight certain experiences that they had during Thanksgiving. And that's kind of an idea about the four Gospels, but the four Gospels go even further than that with the four witnesses. So imagine I sit my four kids down and I say, okay, now each of you, 
I want you to write now to a specific person or a specific group. Uh, Christian, I want you to write a letter about Thanksgiving to Abuela and Abuela. Uh, Kaden, I want you to write to your best friends. And Elaney, I want you to write it as a school project. And Chloe, I just hope that you spell half the words correct and we have some sort of sense of what you're writing. And so we could write all these different things together and we would see the different looks and the different understandings that we would get. And so the four authors of the Gospels come together to write a story, not about Thanksgiving, not about Santa Claus and Christmas, but about who Jesus is, about his arrival, about what he came to accomplish and how he accomplished that. And so that is what we're going to be looking at uh, this season. And the other thing that would help us round out why we have four different Gospels is we believe that Mark would go through and share the Gospel. And he took about 10 years of proclaiming the Gospel before he actually written it down. And so I don't even know if written it down is proper English, but you can correct me later. Uh, and so what happened is then after about 10 years, what they wanted to do is they wanted to write down uh, the Christmas story or the Advent story and the also the story about Jesus and his life. And so Mark wrote down his first gospel, and we believe his was the first. Uh, it may not have been, but through scholarly research, we believe his was the first. And then Matthew, what we're going to be looking at today, took Mark as a template, but he had a specific group he wanted to write to. He wanted to write to the Jews, and he wanted to share things. And so that's what we're going to be doing. Each of these witnesses, we're going to look at them and why they wrote them and to who they wrote them. Now, living in this area of Disney, uh, we're used to storytelling. We're used to really good storytelling here. But oftentimes, when we say the word story, we can loop it into fairy tale. And oftentimes, not even meaning to, we can look at this gospel story, this good news of Jesus, as a fairy tale. Or even now, it's popular to say it's based on a true story where the director would take uh, liberty to go ahead and change certain things to spice it up for cinematic glory. But this story here was told by eyewitnesses. The actual people that walked with Jesus wrote down these stories for us to be able to see and look at them today. And so I encourage you as we're reading through these stories over the next four weeks, that you would see them through the lens of the witness, that you would see it through the pen of the witnesses who were there and who shared this specific story for us. And so this morning, we're going to begin with the Gospel of Matthew. And so what I'd like to do, and I think this is fascinating, during my studies this week, uh, I had the opportunity to discover some really fascinating things that I want to share with you this morning. So the Gospel of Matthew is one of the first book, or is the first book of the New Testament, and Matthew wrote this Gospel to the Jews. So when we're reading this, we're knowing that this Gospel was written to a certain specific people group. And we also believe that Matthew was the author. We see in the first century, around 110, 80 second century, Century, the first mention of this gospel, and it was a, given credit to as the writer as Matthew the tax collector. And you may have known that or may not have known that, but it was Matthew the tax collector that we believe wrote Matthew, though he did not say that he is the author of it. That is who we believe wrote this first gospel. And what is fascinating about Matthew is that Matthew being a tax collector during this time, he would have been like the anti-Robin Hood. So instead of Robin Hood, who steals from the rich and gives to the poor, Matthew was a tax collector that would go to his own people and take money from them to give to the Romans. So in other words, it's like Matthew was oppressing his own people by taking money from them and making them more poor and more oppressed to give to this great rich empire. So to put it in terms of today, it's like Matthew would go and take, say, $100 and say, you, are, you owe us $100 this week. But here's something that was unique about tax collectors back then. They didn't have so many laws of the land that we do today. And what they would do is say, hey, you owe $100, but instead of me telling you that you owe $100, I'd say you owe $150. They would take the $100, they would give that then to Rome, and then they would pocket the other $50. Tax collectors during this time were scandalous people. They were deceivers. They were manipulators. They would go through and take money from their own people and give it to Rome. And then the extra money that they would say that they owed that they didn't, they would use that money to deepen their pockets. 
You can imagine a Jew during this time doing that to their own people, how they would be despised. These were not people that you looked highly upon. And so in the story of Matthew, we see here that Matthew in chapter 9, verse 9, actually became a disciple of Jesus. Now you're starting to understand the scandalous nature. Jesus being born a Jew as well, calling forth his disciples, calls forth the tax collector, a guy who is going against everything that the Jews are believing in and hoping for and oppressing them. That is who Jesus calls to be his disciple. And that's who wrote the gospel of Matthew. In Luke chapter 5, verse 29, Matthew, who's also called Levi here, uh, let me explain that real quick. Oftentimes, we will have different names given to different people. It could be a Hebrew name versus their Greek name. Uh, so for me, I am Tony here in English, and in Spanish, it's Antonio. And so I have two different names, but it means the same thing. Uh, in this, we have Matthew, and we also have Levi, but it's the same person. So in Luke 5, 29, Matthew held a great banquet for Jesus. And he invited all the other tax collectors and sinners to come to this banquet. Now we know Matthew is very rich and we know how he got all of his money. And so he used that money when Jesus called him to throw this great banquet. And you could imagine what would have happened when the Pharisees or the religious people came in and saw what was going on. They thought this was crazy. And actually, we see this in Matthew 9, verse 10 and 11. And so listen to this. As Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came, and they were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And verse 11 says this. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And so what we see here is Jesus eating with these sinners, these people who were scandalous deceivers. And Jesus famously said that I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the sinners. I didn't come for the rich. I came for the poor. I came to those who needed me the most. And this morning, we are going to look at the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to look at the arrival of Jesus and what we are going to discover together is we're going to discover why Jesus came. And the reason Jesus came was for all of us. He came to rescue the sinner. He came to give us a right relationship with God, to restore us, to redeem us, to ransom us, to reconcile us back to God. And this all begins with the birth of Jesus. So let's go ahead and begin our journey here. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 25. If you have our Bibles again, page 757. But if you look at the beginning of the chapter, you're going to see one of the most boring aspects of Scripture known to mankind. It is the genealogies. And if you get really excited about genealogies, that, that's, uh, that's cool because I need to do better at that. However, last Advent season... We actually spent our Christmas season going through the genealogy of Matthew, and we found that there's four women in the genealogy, and we took the time to look at those four women and understand why they were there. Now, Matthew is writing this gospel to the Jews. Let me explain why that's important, because it helps with our story today. Matthew is writing to the Jews because the Jews had the Old Testament. They knew of the coming Messiah. They knew that somebody was going to come to rescue them. But who would they be? It would be someone that came from the line of David, King David, through the Jews, Jewish lineage, through Abraham. And so what uh, Matthew is going to do is he's going to begin by showing why Jesus came through the line of David and why he is the anointed one, the Messiah, the king, the one they were looking for. Because he's writing to the Jews. And the Jews would go ahead and say, no, I know Jesus isn't right because I know Jesus was prophesied to come through the line of David. Matthew begins by saying, yes, Jesus came through the line of David. And then we get to verse 18, and you can follow along with us. Here is the birth story of Jesus according to the Gospel of Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she found him to be, or he, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. 
And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Matthew is going to show us three things here this morning, and I'm excited to share these with you. He's going to show us how Jesus entered into humanity. We're going to see that this morning. We're going to see how Jesus entered humanity. And Matthew also wants to tell us today who Jesus is. And so if you're here and you're seeking or you're searching or you're wondering what this Christianity thing is all about, Matthew tells us who Jesus is. And lastly, Matthew shares with us what Jesus confirms. So let's go ahead and begin. Jesus came to us through a virgin mother. Remember, this was a prophecy, and the Jews understood this to be a messianic prophecy. So in this reading, you're going to notice Matthew, who is writing to a certain people group, writing to the Jews, says this particular thing. He actually quotes back in Isaiah, the prophet, and he quotes Isaiah 7.14. And we see that in verse 23. In your Bible, it may have like indentions in it. It shows you that it's referring to an Old Testament verse. It says, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. That verse right there is actually the exact verse that is in the the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. And so what Matthew is doing here is he's showing the Jews, no, listen, this is the one you have been waiting for. This is the one who is going to rescue and redeem. You may not believe that now, but by the time I'm finished sharing this, you will believe that this is the coming Messiah. And Jesus, were, or the Emmanuel means God with us, and Jesus means Yahweh saves, or Yahweh is salvation. It's transliterated from the Hebrew and Aramaic, and the name is Yeshua. This word is a combination of Yah, which is an abbreviation for Yahweh. Yahweh is the name uh, given to God uh, in Exodus 3.14, the, the name he gave, God gives himself. And the word Yasha means to rescue, to deliver, to save. So what he's going to do is he's going to begin by showing that Jesus was born from a virgin mother according to the prophecy that was laid out many, many, many years ago. So while Mary would be the human mother, God would now be the father. However, he was born to an adoptive father. Now, if you've been journeying with us through the book of Ephesians that we've been going to, adoption is a huge, huge, huge key point of Christianity. Adoption is one of the staples of Christianity. And we saw in Ephesians 1, chapter, three, or chapter 1, verse 3 through 6, we see this adoption story taking place that God set out a plan, though we were far away from him, to adopt us into his family so that when we're adopted as children of God, we'd have all the rights that we would have as an actual child, as an actual heir of God. And those are limitless and boundless. And so what is being shown here is that Jesus is being adopted in to Joseph's family from a human adoption standpoint. We also see the word betrothed here. And a lot of us look at betrothed as engaged. But the problem is our understanding of engagement is a little different today. Our understanding of his engagement is you really like this person, you get engaged to be married. However, if at any point you decide, I don't really want to get married, you can go ahead and break it off and everything's fine. But betrothed meant during this time is that you were legally bind, bounded and married to them. The only thing that was left was to consummate the marriage in the bed. And that would be the last thing that would be needed to go ahead and finish the marriage. And so this was a legally binding thing. And so Joseph is going to become the adoptive father of Jesus. And we see that he becomes the adoptive father of Jesus by him being the one who names the child. 
and he names him Jesus according to what the angels. Jesus also enters in through an adoptive father, through the virgin mother, but he also enters in to a fallen and broken world. And this is one of the most important aspects of Jesus coming. We can look around and we see that we live in a fallen and broken world. We see diseases, we see pains, we see people doing things to other people that are horrendous. We see, look inside of ourselves and we see ourselves that we don't always do the things that we wanna do. Even the things that we wanna do and the good things that we can do, often we do those apart from God, not in collaboration with God or not in partnership of God. And we see how our minds and our hearts are so wicked. And Jesus says that he comes into this world, verse 21, to do a specific thing. Verse 21 says that he comes to call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus was born to save us from our sins. Matthew then wants to tell us who Jesus is. The first thing Matthew tells us about Jesus is that he's the son of man. Jesus was fully human. Jesus was actually born to a virgin human mother and he becomes fully human. That is like mind blowing. How does God become a human being? Well, we're told it's, it's through the virgin birth and through the conception of the Holy Spirit. If anybody knows that completely and fully, please let me know, because that is a mystery that scholars are still trying to wrap their heads around. But it's such a very important part. Philippians 2 tells us in very beautiful language. We actually believe that was a song of the early church. It was telling us about Jesus, who though he was in heaven, did not decide to stay in heaven, but according to the plan of God, put on humanity. Jesus was fully man and came down and was born as a baby. But also we see here, as far as Emmanuel says, that Jesus was fully divine. Jesus is the son of God. He is God with us. So one of the things that Matthew is trying to tell us here this morning is that Jesus was fully man, but Jesus was also fully God. And if you do not believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man, then you're not believing in Christianity. Christianity is that God came down to be with us. Jesus is fully God, and he clothed himself in humanity. Lastly, Matthew is going to share with us what Jesus confirms. God is always faithful to his word. You know, this is why I talked about Matthew from the beginning, because Matthew is showing that Jesus is in the lineage of David through the, um, the genealogy. Matthew is going to show that Jesus is the son of God because he was born of a virgin that was shown in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And what is being shown here is that always and always Jesus is going to carry out the plans of the father because God is always faithful to his word. If we need to grow in our faith, we need to grow in our knowledge of who God is. The more we know who God is, the more we know what he set out to accomplish, the more that we understand how he accomplished that pur purpose is the more that our faith is going to grow. We'll fall more in love with who God is and we'll be able to live our life according to his purpose for his glory. And we will ultimately receive joy from that. God is always faithful to his word. Matthew is also showing that God is transcendent. Do we know what that word means? It means that it is above, I had to look it up just so you know, so it's okay. It means that it is above and beyond us. It is, oh, God is over us, above. God is infinitude, if you were here during our attributes. God is limitless. God is beyond our th all things. He is sovereign. He is in charge of all things. He is God. He is over all. But yet Matthew is also showing that this God is also with us. This God is with us, in us today through the Holy Spirit, accomplishing the plan through Jesus. God himself put forth this plan before time began, that this God put on humanity to be with us. And we can know how much he loves us because he is with us and he has made a way for us to be able to be back with him. God is transcendent, but he is also present with us. Matthew is wanting to share the gospel, the good news to the Jews. The people who he once deceived, the people who he once stole from, he is now sharing the good news. The people he betrayed in order to work for the enemy, 
he is now calling forth to be rescued. Matthew is speaking to those who do not believe the gospel so that they would know that the promised Messiah has come. The Christ is alive in heaven and was alive here on earth and then conquered death so that we too can conquer death one day. Death is not the end. Death is only the next step in the transition that God has called us to be a part of. And that is why Jesus came. That is the Advent story, is that Jesus came to rescue us from our own sins. So if you've heard of Jesus, but do not know why he is so important, or you understand the reason, or you do not understand the reason he was born, Matthew is talking to you this morning, hoping that through the proclamation and the heralding of his gospel, that you would come to believe and know that Jesus was born also to save you. So to the unbeliever this morning, to the one who's questioning whether this is all real, to the one here this morning that isn't sure if you are a Christian, or to the one here who thinks they're a Christian but needs to make sure that they do believe this, Matthew is sharing that Jesus came And like he said in verse 21, he came to save you from your sins. Romans tells us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans tells us also that the wages of these sins are death. And we all experience death all around us constantly. And so what we see here is we see that all of us have sinned. We can look at just the Ten Commandments and see how many times that we have broken those over and over and over. But throughout the Bible, we see things even worse. We see even our most righteous deeds, even the things that are great, walking a lady across the street, giving to missions or giving to help uh, fund pro cho- or choices or whatever the case that you may be willing to do. If you do that apart from the glory of God, we are doing it for our own glory and for our own purposes. That in itself is sin. We are covered with complete and total utter destruction because our whole lives are marked by sin which is why we cannot be with God because God cannot be with sin. So we have a huge problem here, but Jesus came to rescue us. So why was Jesus born? He was born so that the sin that we have would be taken off of ourselves and Jesus would pay the punishment for our sin. A good and righteous judge is going to condemn the one who has made the the murder or stolen the item or whatever the case has been. A good judge will condemn that person. And what Jesus is saying is not that you're perfect, not that you are good, but he is saying, I am perfect and I am good. And what I am going to do for you is I'm going to take your punishment upon myself so that then when you are standing before the judge, You are going to receive my goodness, my righteousness, and I am going to take your punishment. The wrath of God is set upon the unbeliever, the just wrath of God. And that's not to be all fire and brimstone. That's just what the Bible teaches us. And the only way that we can be rescued is by putting our faith and hope in the one who stood in our place, the one who has taken that upon himself so that we too can be rescued. And we are rescued through Jesus. Jesus came to save us from our sin. And Jesus did exactly that for all who believe and put their faith and hope in who he is. Jesus came and entered into humanity to rescue you from yourself, to rescue you from just and righteous judgment that is rightfully due to you. Not just to you though, but to me to all of those who believe. It's not that I am any better than any of you. I am in just the same boat as all of us. The only difference between the unbeliever and the believer is the believer has put their faith and trust in the one who can rescue and restore to them to the purpose that you are created. That's the only difference. And because of that, it is a gigantic difference because now that we have been rescued and restored, we have a right relationship with God. And so to the... To the unbeliever, that is my call to you. To the seasoned saint, maybe you are here and you've heard this gospel story a hundred times. You can quote it from memory and you know this story. It's so easy for us this Advent season to forget the purpose and the meaning and the reason. And we may not find the joy My hope for you this morning is that you would hear the gospel story, you would hear the birth of Jesus, and you would be captured again with awe and wonder of what that means. 
what Jesus accomplished for you. May you hear that and be refreshed and renewed and find great joy in what Jesus has done for you because it's so easy for us to forget. So I encourage you to remember that. And to everybody else, Matthew is telling us something amazing for the believer who is burdened by their past, for the believer who has been haunted Maybe your lips have been tightened from proclaiming this good news of Jesus because of what you have done. The reason why I took so much time to tell you about Matthew this morning and how he was a tax collector, how he was an enemy of the Jews. We ourselves, if we look, and I may be the only one here, but probably not, I can look back upon my life and I can see all the people that I've wronged. I can see all the things that I've done that I regret greatly. I can see the people that I have hurt. I can see all these different things and choices that I wish I could go back and change and do differently. Matthew knows exactly what that means because he spent his life conniving and and deceiving people and taking money from them, making himself rich while he's making the people that he loves poor. And so what Matthew is telling us this morning as well is it doesn't matter what you have done, how you have hurt other people, or what you have done to deceive others, whatever the case is, that when Jesus calls you, you have been redeemed and restored. And now you get the opportunity to go to the people who you once hurt and give them something far greater than just an I'm sorry. You can give them something far greater than anything that you have done wrong to them. It can be made up a hundredfold because what is being wrong to somebody here on earth is a temporary thing. But what happens for eternity lasts beyond time. And so I would encourage you today not to be taken back by what you have done or how you have hurt other people. But like Matthew, be renewed to tell this story. Matthew is not the hero of this story. He is the anti-hero of the story. Jesus is the hero of the story. Jesus is the reason why Matthew now has the ability to share this good news to the Jews and why he has the ability to share it with us today. So my prayer for you guys today is that we would be ignited by this story, that we would remember why Jesus had to come in the first place so that it would encourage us to now go and to tell this birth story to our friends, to our neighbors, to our loved ones, to anybody that we can come in contact with, that we are a people who have fallen short of God's purpose. We have sinned. We are separated from him. But God being rich in mercy, made a way for us through his son. And that son was born in a manger to a virgin mother, adopted by Joseph, put into the line of King David so that he could save us from our sins. That is the greatest gift that anybody can receive this Christmas season. And we get to be the ones to actually give that gift And so we encourage you today to go out with this story, with this gospel. Gospel means good news and to proclaim it to all that we come in contact with. Like Matthew, the witness, may we all eagerly anticipate the sharing of the birth story and what it means to those around us this Advent season. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for rescuing us through his life, through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection, because of his birth coming down, we have now been redeemed. We have been ransomed by him. Father, help us to believe in that. Help us to have a knowledge of what Jesus has done. Help us to have a heart transformation to fall in love with the story that has been shared to us today. And help us commit our lives to what you are now calling us to. And the first thing we can do is share that. So we ask for your help in being able to share this gospel and this good news. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.